Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Um, this is a pretty big group. Um, so if you wouldn't mind keeping yourself muted unless you've got something to say, um, I will try to monitor the chat. Uh, but as I mentioned, there's, um, I got a lot of slides to cover. So I'm gonna be trying to move pretty quickly and hopefully we'll have some time at the end to share and talk and uh, revisit some of the stuff that we've talked about. Um, but let me go ahead and get my screen up. Okay, so first things first, I had intended to um, talk about a lot more the whole history and it became clear really quickly that um, I was just not going to be able to cover everything in the amount of time that I had given myself for the program or for the uh, <laughs> for the time limit for you know my research. Uh, so I just decided to stick with the first 200 years. So we're going to go up to about uh, 1900. Uh, and then if you all are interested in more, if you want, want to hear more about the 20th century, um, let me know and I will happily do a sequel um, at some point. But for now, it's going to be basically 1683 to 1900. So let's get going. Okay. All right. So at the very beginning, we have no maps from this time period. Uh, Poughkeepsie really wasn't settled until the very, very late 17th century. Um, so I just pulled this map from the 1640s. This is Adrian Vanderdonk's map of New Netherland. Um, here you can see the Wappingers kill, and this is the territory of the Wappingers. Um, so we're about here, um, and there's really not not anything uh, happening. No big, you know, they don't consider the Fall Kill a big enough creek to put on their map, I guess. Um, just as an aside, Vanderdonks, his honorific was John Keir, and that is how uh, Yonkers was named because he owned the land down there. So just a little, little aside on that. Um, okay, so the first colonial deed uh, was on May 5th, 1683. An indigenous Wappender named Masani uh, signed a deed over to Peter Lansing and Jane Smead, Jan Smeads for the area uh, around the Fallkill Creek, right at the mouth of the river. Um, their intention was to build a mill down there. Um, prior to this deed, there's not any clear evidence of a permanent settlement in this area, um, but it was certainly used by the indigenous people uh, for many years as uh, a fishing spot, a hunting spot. There were several bays in the area um, that sort of made for protected uh, waterways for fishing. And there's been a lot of artifacts that have been found around the upper landing area over the years. Um, so we know that they were utilizing this space, even, even if there wasn't necessarily a, a village here. Um, the first colonial patent um, was signed over to these two gentlemen, uh, Mindert Hermans and Robert Sanders in 1686. Um, this map is from 1754, but uh, you can see they land out the, ter the territory here. So there's the Herman Sanders, it was all of this. Um, and then in 1688, they sold their, uh, Oh, he, sorry, Peter Schuyler sold it or purchased it in 1688 and then sold it to them in 1699. Uh, and just to get a sense of the scale of how large of a piece of land this is, uh, you can see the courthouse is right here and here's Route 9. Um, and this is going all the way back here to the edges of the Rombout and the Van Cortlands. Um, so it was a really, really big territory in this patent. Um, So the creek was in the indigenous language was typically called the Winneke. Um, the Dutch named it the Valkyl or the Falkill, And that's how we end up with this. And it is really uh, the very first uh, of any kind of settling that happens in Poughkeepsie happens right here at the mouth of the Falkill. Um, by 1699, there is a sawmill here. Um, I've read various accounts that said Minder Hermans was the first person to actually live here. Uh, and Robert Sanders really just owned the land. I've also read that it was Robert Sanders mill. Um, so one of the two was living here. I think, I think it's more likely that Hermans was the first resident, um, but I'm not sure who owned the sawmill. Okay, so that's it for that uh, century. It's pretty short. <laughs> uh, so we're gonna move into the 18th century, uh, which is when the development really starts to happen. 
Um, this is also, we have very few maps from this time period also, unfortunately, um, some property maps, but they don't really give you any sense of the land or the geography. Um, so I've got this 1799 one because it can give you a pretty good shot of the whole waterfront. Here, right here is the Fall Kill and that's Livingston store. Um, Call Rock is right here, Union store, shipyard. And we're gonna talk about all of these places uh, as we move along, um, but you can just see what it looks like there. Um, so we're gonna start at Upper Landing. Um, in 1710, Upper Landing uh, was purchased by Colonel Leonard Lewis. Uh, he buys the area and he builds his house on top of the hill, which is called uh, Slang Clip or a Snake Hill. Um, he leaves the property to his family when he dies in 1730. Um, in 1755, Martin Hoffman takes over um, and he's operating a sawmill there at the creek and he's got stores. And in 1757, he builds a dock um, because he wants to ship his goods out, have his goods shipped in, and he's trying to encourage more boats to come to where he's at. Uh, in 1772, the docks are purchased by John Schenck Jr., uh, who goes on to become a commissary officer in the Continental Army. Uh, right. And a big uh, portion right. of Upper Landing's history is that for, for some time, it was uh, a commissary depot for the Continental Army uh, for most of the Hudson Valley and Poughkeepsie. All of the supplies that he had coming in and out were coming in and out of the Upper Landing site during the war. Uh, in 1778, it's sold to Walter Livingston. Uh, the, the Livingstons are responsible for building the house that we call the Hoffman House in 1789, uh, as well as some other houses and mills. Uh, and then in 1796, it goes to Robert Livingston. Uh, it should certainly be mentioned here that the Livingstons um, owned huge swaths of the land at this point. Uh, they were slaveholders. Um, they, that is largely, you know, a good, portion of how they made and kept their wealth and power. Uh, and Upper Landing was almost certainly a place where enslaved Africans were, were brought to this area. And many of them worked on the docks. And, you know, this is something that, you know, it doesn't come up in the, the history books that I was reading from 100 years ago, but it is, it is a fact of this history uh, that we all should acknowledge. Okay, so we're gonna move down the waterfront a little bit to uh, the Union Store Landing, which is located right now um, at what we call Call Rock Park, right underneath the Mid-Hudson Bridge. Uh, so in 1795, George Evertson was deeded this land from Gilbert Livingston. Uh, this right here is just a portion of that deed. It is very large. Uh, there was no way you'd be able to see any if I tried to get the whole picture. So I tried to just grab a shot. Uh, we do have this in our collection. Um, yeah, most, like I said, most of the land was owned by the Livingstons at this point. Uh, they were they were wheeling and dealing and selling plots all along the river. Uh, Everton himself was a wealthy man. Uh, he came from an old family in the area and he built himself a large mansion on Cannon Street uh, right around the turn of the century, last century. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, so that was Union Store. And this is just a portrait of George. Uh, this is from the plant book. Um, he ran a dock and a shipyard down there, um, as well as one of the first general stores. Um, he was, you know, selling all the goods and services that were coming up on the boats from New York City, uh, because this city was certainly not self-sufficient uh, at this point. Um, and he was also assisting with the export of crops and lumber, which is a pretty big industry here and, and throughout all the time that we're going to talk about lumber become is, is a constant on the waterfront. Uh, you really never see it go away, uh, at least until 1900. Um, and Union Street was named for this store and this landing. It was the original termination point of Union Street before all the roads came through and the arterials were built. Union Street went all the way down uh, to that park. So that is how we got the name of that street. Um, and this is just a little more of a close up of these areas. Uh, as you can see, there is no Main Street yet. Um, this map 1799, Main Street had not been brought down yet. It stops at the courthouse. So we've got Livingston Store and Mill Street. Uh, and here we've got the Union Store coming down. Um, and there's also a road to Call Rock because Call Rock was an excellent lookout point. Um, people could go there and watch for ships coming in um, either for supplies or, you know, people coming in or, you know, during the war, they went there to 
keep an eye out for enemy British ships coming through. Um, so that was a pretty important spot on the landscape at the time. Uh, uh, another really big industry of this early waterfront period uh, was shipyards. So they were building ships at all of these points. You can see here Shipyard Road, Shipyard, Shipyard Point. There's a little bay in between here. Um, this is Union Landing right here. But they're, they're building ships at a lot of these places and they're also, you know, freighting lumber and crops. This is, this is the main industry of the waterfront uh, that's going on down here at this period. Which brings us to the Continental, Continental Navy Shipyard. Uh, this was Poughkeepsie's first boom industry. Um, it really, uh, Poughkeepsie's location was far enough north that uh, the Continental Army felt it was relatively safe from British invasion and it would be an excellent spot to build some ships, to build some frigates, uh, to, to boost the, the burgeoning Navy. Um, Poughkeepsie was selected to build two of 13 ships that were commissioned. Um, this starts bringing in people uh, in a much bigger way because now there's, there's truly an industry happening up here. Uh, and it's also bringing the attention of more people that are you know, in charge of things. And, and it's not just, I mean, it is still a tiny backwater town, uh, but it's getting, it's getting a little more noticed uh, from all sorts of folks at this point. Um, uh, in addition to the frigates, Washington was also ordering that they build fire rafts up here, um, which are basically what they sound like. It's a boat that's meant to be burned uh, to create an obstruction for enemy ships. Um, and they also were rigging up old sort of useless boats to be sunk uh, to create more obstacles for ships coming up the river. So lots of stuff happening here. And this is just a picture of what they might have looked like. We don't have, I don't have any images of the two ships that were built here. Um, and we'll, we'll find out why in just a sec. Um, there was a lot of fear that the British were going to uh, advance up and, and burn the ships before they could even be built. Um, and there was also some real money issues. So there's reports of the carpenters going on strike several times because they were not being paid. Uh, the Continental Congress could not provide funds. Um, so it was, it was you know, a difficult endeavor but the ships were built. They were built, they were finished by the winter of 1776. Um, and they were kind of brought up over to around the Rondau to be stored and saved. Um, but then during the, the, the Battle of Fort Montgomery in 1777, uh, the ships were brought down to help reinforce the fleets. They were not completely armed or fully manned. Um, and one of them quickly ran aground and another one fell into some trouble and they were both essentially uh, burned down there to prevent them from being captured and used uh, by the British. So they were never fully armed and they never went to sea. Um, so sort of a, a sad end, but that's, that's war for you. It doesn't, uh, doesn't always end the way you want. And for that, we'll, we'll round out uh, the 18th century with that. And we're gonna move on to the real, the real big one, which is, 1800 to 1899. Uh, this is when things really get very busy. Um, and right here, there's just a, a little map of the shoreline. And you can see that there's just a lot more development happening all along the waterfront. You can also see the streets being laid out up here. And this is 1834. And you know, you can see a huge, a huge change in not very many years. Um, so the first uh, big industry, and this actually predates the 1800s a bit, um, but the ferries. So Anthony Yelverton uh, is believed to have operated the first ferry, um, and it's thought that he he was doing this, you know, before the war began. Um, he was originally a Poughkeepsie resident, um, and the the word is that he he rode across the river in 1754 and used the boat to build his house and decided that that's where he was going to be. Um, and he started uh, running a ferry back and forth from Highland, also known as New Paltz Landing, also known as Yelverton Landing, um, to just north of Upper Landing. And the first ferries, again, they were rowed by enslaved individuals. Um, There's very little documentation that we've been able to find. I know that the, one of the researchers over in Highland has been looking to try to find more information 
about these and it's just been really, really difficult. There's little in the paper. I would, this newspaper article right here um, from 1793 is the first instance I can find of a regular fairy even being mentioned in the paper. Uh, that does not mean that it wasn't there. I just haven't been able to find it. Um, but yeah, so, and this, this is about a stolen horse um, and the horse is supposed to have been ferried across at Baker's Ferry in Poughkeepsie. Um, by the early 1800s, uh, the ferries were being operated by horses walking on treadmills. Um, and that, that was the primary method until steam power became prevalent and the steam engine uh, copyright expired and it could be used by everyone, uh, which we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, and the ferry operated, you know, well into the 20th century, um, even, at, even past the building of the bridge. It, it finally shut down in 1931. Um, and I mean, I, I don't suppose it will come back because Highland Landing is not an easy place to get to. Um, but you'll notice that in Newburgh, they, you know, they got rid of their ferry when they built a bridge and then they brought it back because they realized that um, they could still be useful. So it's just interesting to see uh, the ebb and flow of those things. All right, this is just, this map, this 1834 map is the first map we have that actually shows the ferry landing on here. And this is just an illustration of what those horse drawn fairies looked like um, with the little guys on their little treadmills powering the wheel, which I like. All right, back to Upper Landing. Uh, Upper Landing was sold in uh, 1800 to Martin, Isaac, and Robert Hoffman. Uh, these are relatives of the previous Martin Hoffman in the last century who had really done a lot of work on the docks and, and built the docks and built some of the warehouses and mills. Um, this is also when you start to see the term upper landing really getting used. Um, before that, it's often just called, you know, Hoffman's dock or whoever, Livingston store. But you start to see upper landing appearing on here. And this is just a couple ads uh, showing the kinds of things that, that the Hoffman and Co were doing uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, they owned their own sloop. Uh, their sloop Mary was captained by Abram, Abraham Hoffman, clearly another family member. Um, and so they were selling flour and plaster and rum and brandy and gin and pine and boards, and sugar and coffee. Um, so truly general stores covering all of your bases. Um, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I got a little funny with my, uh, settings here, but I just, I found this a little interesting because um, a lot of these early maps, you still see it called slang clip, um, which was uh, the Dutch word for snake hill. Um, this bluff right here, you can see there's slang clip right by the ferry dock. Um, and I found this, uh, this little ad when they're talking about the first, uh, first bus in Poughkeepsie, uh, that they had named slang clip after this spot. Um, right near the, the projecting point on the dock of the Poughkeepsie Whaling Company. Um, and this is from 1835. I, I apologize for that uh, difficulty to read on that one. And we're just gonna move on. This is more upper landing stuff. Um, in 1816, James Reynolds and Aaron Innes um, buy a good portion of the upper landing, um, the mills and the, sh the docks and the warehouses from the Hoffman's. Um, and these names, this Innes and Reynolds, they, they will dominate uh, the upper landing site for pretty much the rest of the century. Um, also down here, we'll start to see the, this name Arnold um, and they're, uh, they, they're running a lumber business initially, uh, but they also uh, move into chair making and they're down there on the waterfront pretty much right through the rest of the decade. Um, and over here, you just see some ads for some of the steamboats uh, that were running out of Upper Landing. The Albany, there's a sloop and a steamboat. So they're still operating with both different technologies, uh, trying to get whoever they can uh, to their landing. Because we're now gonna start to see some real competition going on uh, between the various landings in Poughkeepsie and everyone's vying for the same sorts of businesses. So they're doing freighting and they're trying to do passenger um, and, industry is really starting to build. Uh, the Reynolds family, we're just going to talk about them real quickly because uh, they, like I said, they, they really dominated this area for many, many years. Um, they, they, at a certain point, they own 
the whole upper landing, they really take over um, and it becomes, you know, they're, they're the main property owners. This was the Reynolds house, the Hoffman house is nearby. Um, this store right here called the Fall Kill store um, was originally a warehouse built in 1810, I believe. Um, it lasted a long time. Uh, and the, so the Fall Kill would be right here. It's coming right through here. And this is sort of on this property over here. Um, and this is just some of the kinds of ads that uh, I found in the paper for them. And again, like these guys were selling just about everything you could imagine. Butter, salt, cement, flour, mackerel, hams, um, and on and on. This W.W. and J. Reynolds. Um, and they're at this point by 1827, uh, Reynolds and Innes are also running the ferry. Um, so they've really taken over all of the industry at the landing at this point in its history. And this is just uh, a quick look at, this is a ledger that we have in our collection. Uh, it is from W.W. W. Reynolds, uh, it covers 1869 to 1871. This is what it looks like on the cover. Uh, and it's just a list of accounting, um, mostly for vendors and suppliers um, and just lots. And we also have one for W.T. Reynolds, who was the, the one of the ancestors that comes a little bit later in the early 20th century. We have some of his ledgers in the collection as well. Um, primarily thanks, I believe, to Helen Wilkinson Reynolds, who donated a lot of stuff to us over the years. Um, so moving down south again, uh, we're going to go to what was originally called uh, Davies Dock and Davies Store, um, but pretty quickly becomes known as the Main Street Dock because in 1800, Main Street gets brought all the way down to the water, and that's right here. So this would be present day Warriors Park. Um, and so uh, Davies purchased this land, uh, this huge swath of land on the waterfront in 1798, um, and he was owning and operating his dock, store, and freighting company. Um, it, it will eventually become the busiest part of the waterfront. Uh, at this point, Upper Landing is still is still really reigning supreme. Um, but later on, and as the decades go on, we'll see more and more things shift down uh, to the Main Street dock. It's part of the evolution of the waterfront. Um, but in 1815, William Davies was one of the five largest taxpayers in Poughkeepsie, uh, as well as George Evertson, who owned the Union Store Landing. Uh, so you can see just how valuable these waterfront properties are. Um, the, the people that are down here are, are the most influential people in Poughkeepsie. Uh, they're making the most money and they have the most control over the decision making in what is still, still a village at this point, um, but is growing very rapidly. All right, now this is a big, big seismic shift for the world um, and also Poughkeepsie. Um, in 1814, uh, Poughkeepsie becomes the first steamboat terminal between New York and Albany. Uh, this is it, the steamboat Firefly from the Fulton and Livingston fleet. Um, and they were gonna start stopping in Poughkeepsie. Uh, and so this was a big deal. Um, suddenly we're part of the route. And I mean, eventually, you know, pretty quickly they were stopping at Newburgh and Kingston and all these other places too. Um, really, really connecting the Hudson Valley in a way that had not been possible before. Um, you know, the, the sloops went down to the city maybe once a week, maybe twice. Um, so steamboats could, could come up two, three times a week and it just facilitated a lot more uh, interplay between the communities. Uh, and again, yeah, so this, the, all the steamboats at first were going out of Main Street. Um, because there was a copyright on the steam engine. So Livingston and Fulton were the only people that were able to operate steamships for a period of time. Uh, and they stopped at Main Street. So that was, they had the monopoly on that. Um, but there's still plenty of freight being shipped from Upper Landing, Lower Landing and the Union Store. Uh, these are just a couple ads uh, from some of the tow boats and the steamboats. This is after the uh, copyright has expired. Um, and you're starting to see these boats proliferate at all of the landings. Um, so this is a towboat line. Um, this one is for, I just say, uh, I think this one is the one that's at, this one's at Main Street 
And I think this one is a uh, union landing, yeah. Um, so the steamboats are coming and going. They've got ads in the paper. There's still sloops going as well. Um, but you really start to see this ramp up. There's all these different companies uh, coming and going that are, are selling passenger and freight uh, fares for the steamboats down to New York. All right, now uh, one, one of a favorite topic uh, for all is the, the whaling industry in Poughkeepsie. Um, this early, early 1830s, um, this is a, it's a huge industry uh, in America and the world. Um, you know, whale oil was used for, for lamps. It was used, the ambergris was used for perfume. The whale bones were used for corsets. Um, it's truly a, a big boom industry and all of the rich men in Poughkeepsie uh, wanted to get a piece of that action. Um, so they're watching places like New Bedford uh, really have this huge boom economy from whaling and even Hudson has started and Newburgh also was attempting to get in on it. So they pretty quickly form two companies, the Poughkeepsie Whaling Company and the Duchess Whaling Company. The Duchess Whaling Dock is located right just north of Upper Landing here, slang clip, and you see it right here. Uh, and the Poughkeepsie Whaling Company was down a little bit further by Main Street, right by Davies Dock right here. Um, so yes, uh, you're gonna see these names over and over and over again. These guys were speculators. Um, so Matthew Vassar, James Hooker, Alexander Coffin, Nathaniel Talmadge, um, they, they saw this happening all around them and they wanted a piece of it. So they really started pushing to start these companies. Um, they did employ some locals, but by and large, all of the skilled seamen and the whalers were brought in from New Bedford. So in terms of an economic boom for the people of Poughkeepsie, not so much. Um, it was really just, you know, for the speculators. Um, the very first ship was the Vermont. Uh, it sailed the Atlantic and the Pacific, um, and it came back uh, with $16,000 worth of oil. Um, although, unfortunately, the captain of the Vermont is thought to have been killed in a mutiny. It's possible that he, you know, was sick and died at sea, but there's been some, some fuzziness about what happened to him, and they, they think he may have been, been offed by his own crew. Uh, and then there was another setback in which the, the, one of the ships was wrecked off the coast of Chile. Um, the ships were expensive and, you know, it was really difficult uh, to, to make money when, when you're losing, you know, the, the, the fleets were not big. I think it was a total of seven ships between the two of them at its height. Uh, so you lose one and it's a big part of your business. Um, and by 1835, they, they've consolidated their operations to the same dock, the Northern dock, and they've sort of abandoned that Southern dock. And by 1837, the Poughkeepsie Whaling Company is out of business. They sell all of their supplies, all their ships uh, to the Duchess Whaling Company. And the idea is consolidate, and maybe this one uh, will be able to keep it going. Um, I mean, at its height, the industry was the fifth largest sector of the US economy. Um, so it was, you know, they had a potential to be incredibly profitable, uh, but it was also very dangerous, uh, both for the crew and for the investors. It was, it was really a risky kind of gamble as a proposition. Um, and we'll see more of this kind of speculation and in industry going on with a lot of these same gentlemen, like they're trying to get their hands into everything. Um, and this was an example of something that they tried that didn't, didn't really work. Um, this endeavor was very short-lived. Um, they never really turned a profit. You know, I think they, they were barely making their own expenses back. Um, and by 1845, uh, it's, it's all pretty much done. And the only thing that remains is the fact that they call the whaling docks the whaling docks for the rest of the century. And so you'll see that on all the maps, it says the whaling docks, but it was, it was a pretty short-lived industry. Um, and these are just some of the ads that I pulled from the paper. Um, about Hudson and Newburgh and our guys here trying to start their own business. You can see they mentioned the company was incorporated in Newburgh last winter um, and they, uh, they, they want to be a part of it. <laughs> here we just have, this is what one of the investors notes if you were going to you know, buy some shares of the capital stock. Uh, there's an advertisement in the paper. Uh, 
letting people know that they can invest if they'd like. And this is the kind of thing that they would get uh, if they did sell. Um, and again, the list of names, uh, all, all familiar names to anyone who knows, who's paid attention to Poughkeepsie history. Um, and this just, and I wanted to grab this shot that shows the whaling dock. Um, and also what I like about this is, you know, part of what I found interesting is watching the geography of the waterfront change over the years. Um, and this bay, it's questionable when it was actually filled in. You can see here's the original natural line. Um, and then they have this filled in, but I've, I've come across later maps past this 1834 where this bay is still in existence. So I don't know that it was filled in here. This could just be, you know, there's a lot of, you see some speculation on these maps too, about what's to come and plans that are in place that haven't existed yet. And we'll talk about that a little bit later too. Um, but it's just really interesting to watch the waterfront uh, physically change through all of this. And, uh, and you see the start of that up here. All right, now we're going to talk about another heavy hitter uh, in, in the world of Poughkeepsie and the waterfront for sure. Um, and that is, of course, uh, Matthew Vassar and Vassar's Brewery. So in 1796, James Vassar emigrates from England with his family, uh, including his sons, Matthew and John Guy. Uh, and they soon begin brewing beer uh, from the barley that he has brought over uh, and growing on his farm, which is further east, uh, kind of near the Wappingers on Manchester Bridge. Um, uh, in 1803, or by 1803, uh, they have moved into the village uh, and are operating a small brewery uh, on Vassar Street uh, by 1809. Um, and at this point in his career, Matthew Vassar is a young man. He is not shown that much interest in the family business. So his father apprentices him to a tanner, which he absolutely despises. So he runs away to Bombville. Uh, down near Newburgh and spent several years working uh, for various shopkeepers down there. But by 1810, he is back and he's working with the family business. I guess he decided that uh, it was a better opportunity for him there. Sadly, in 1811, uh, a fire destroys the brewery um, and kills James' oldest son, John Guy Vassar, who would have been the original uh, heir to the Vassar brewery, um, but, but he dies quite young. and. By 1812, Matthew Vassar has taken over the family business. Uh, the brewery on Vassar is eventually rebuilt, um, although Matthew spends some time uh, selling his ale uh, out of the basement of the courthouse. Um, and the, the local lore is that he was the first person to bring oysters to Poughkeepsie and he was serving them in the basement of the courthouse down there. Is it true? I don't know, it's a nice story. Um, so yes, what does this have to do with the waterfront? Uh, so in 1832, uh, he moves uh, down to the waterfront. He's expanding. He's gone into partnership with his nephews um, and he builds this huge complex down by the waterfront to be closer to the shipping industry. Um, so he built this huge complex down here and I'll show you a map in a sec. Uh, it, it flourishes and at a, at a certain point it is the largest brewery in the country. Uh, this is just from 1887. This is from the Sanborn insurance maps. And you can see here's the waterfront right here. Here's North Water Street. And it takes up the, that whole area um, is, his, is his spot. Um, eventually, uh, in part due to the new influx of immigrants that come into Poughkeepsie in the later half of the 19th century, uh, coming from Germany and places like that, uh, the English ales fall out of style. Um, people become more interested in German lagers. And by the turn of the century, Vassar Brewery is no more. Um, but its success did go on uh, to build Vassar College, of course. And uh, his nephews, Matthew Vassar Jr. and John Guy Vassar also built uh, Vassar Hospital, as well as Vassar Institute, the Vassar Home for Old Men. Um, many, many philanthropic works uh, with this fortune. So you gotta give them credit for that. And this is just a little picture uh, of what the waterfront was looking like around this time frame. And I believe like, this would be Matthew, Matthew Vassar's brewery right here. You can see here's Main Street coming down. And you got, this might be the ferry, you got a sloop, you got a steamboat, uh, just a general character. This is College Hill up here. Uh, no, no, how, no school up there yet. Um, and then, let's see. 
down on Main Street for the first time, uh, we can see that there is a hotel. Um, and this is kind of a change because now, you know, at this dock, we've got the steamboats coming right here. So suddenly there's a lot more passenger travel um, enough to, and, and, and you know, passenger travel where people aren't coming to stay, they're maybe just spending a night and then they want to get back on the ship. Um, so we're starting to see hotels down here. Uh, this one was owned or was operated by Leonard Van Cleek. Uh, it will later become known as the Exchange Hotel, but it was built in 1834. And yeah, it's the first one we see down there. Also here is C. Vassar, which is Charles Vassar's Brickyard. Um, this was Matthew Vassar's uncle, James's brother. And uh, he was apparently not as good a businessman as the rest of his family because the Brickyard was not doing well. So in 1837, Matthew Vassar takes over this business. And so he's running that one as well. It was one of many Brickyards along the waterfront. So down to Union Landing, um, starting to fade in importance. You can see in the early 19th century, it's still got, you know, some, some businesses and houses clustered around it. You got the Union Store, there's a pottery. Um, they've got a sloop running from here, 1809. Um, but it, it's sort of waning as, as a major port at this point. Uh, and then we'll move down to Lower Landing, uh, which is this area right here. Um, and at this point, you can see it's being operated by Uriah Gregory uh, is running in, in the 1830s. He's running steams and towboats. Um, and there's also lots of freighting going down here. Um, there's the Southwick Tannery, uh, which we can talk about a little bit later, but we didn't, I never really found much about them, but they're there for a long, long time. Um, but yeah, in 1825, when that patent uh, for the steam engine expires, you see all these guys at all these different places. Uh, running their towboats and steamboats. Uh, a towboat was just a passenger boat that was pulled behind a steamboat. Um, I don't know. I think maybe, you know, some of them, like it would be a, a steamboat that was carrying entirely freight, but it would tow a passenger. Um, I'm not quite sure, but that is uh, what a towboat is. Okay, now the railroad. The railroad comes to town. Um, another project of Matthew Vassar and his band of wealthy industrialists. Um, they first start pushing for a railroad in the 1830s, but not this one. They're looking for one to go more east over to Connecticut. Um, they want to connect with that area uh, for trade and commerce. Um, but then in 1841, they start developing the Harlem line much further east in Dutchess County. Um, and this gets everybody at the waterfront pretty scared um, because they're afraid that this new shipping route uh, will completely take away their business and they will either be forced to relocate somewhere else or, or you know, really suffer. Um, so they start really pushing for a North-South Railroad to come up along the river. So in 1847, uh, Vassar and his cohorts, they raised $3 million to support the charter of the Hudson River Railroad. Uh, and by 1849, uh, the first car is coming. Um, you know, part of the issue was that, of course, you know, at that time, the river still froze. Um, so shipping both in and out of Poughkeepsie during the coldest months was incredibly difficult to impossible. Uh, so having a railroad really would have helped all of these guys uh, keep their businesses as, as year round businesses. Um, and that's, yeah, so the railroad comes through. And then it, uh, it's going to change a lot um, for the waterfront and for everybody else. And here's just another quick cutout of you know, that's our brewery, got some boats in the front, and you know, now we've got the steamships coming through, or the, sorry, the, the trains coming through, uh, changing the landscape yet again. All right, now we're going to move to 1850. And as you can see, things are really, really bustling now. We've got all kinds of guys down here. The railroad has come through and you can see it's right here. Uh, very close to all these businesses. They don't have to do any relocating. They still have access to the water. Now they also have access to trains for freight. Um, and on this map, you can see this bay has not been filled in yet. So I'm, I'm really not sure when that happened, um, but it does eventually happen. And this right now is the, basically the site of uh, the Duchess One apartments. But so down here on the whaling dock, uh, we've got, um, Vassar has some warehouses you can see, um, uh, but there's also the, 
the AJ Coffin foundry, which is the first time we'll see a foundry of any kind down here. He's building stoves and furnaces primarily. Um, and it, this business goes back to at least 1834, uh, although I did not see it on that earlier map. Um, and there's just a, a, a quick ad, old stand, but new firm. Um, you know, these guys are changing partners all the time and that's what a lot of these ads are about, but they just wanna make sure that everyone knows their furnace business will be extensively carried on. You know, the Duchess Whaling Company is docked. Uh, large quantities of stoves of the newest patterns. Um, and then we also see over here, Gifford, Sherman, and Innes, um, familiar names from Upper Landing. Um, these guys at this point um, are starting a dye wood factory uh, and it starts out up here. Uh, it will quickly move down uh, to the actual Upper Landing site, but uh, they are, they're basically importing exotic lumber from all over the world and using it to make dyes for leathers and other things. Um, they soak and it, it's a whole process where they, they extract the color from the wood. Uh, and so we see them up here for the first time too. And there's just a, a quick ad about the beginning of their endeavors right here, Gifford, Sherman and Innes. Uh, we've also got uh, at Upper Landing, we've got Dowdy and Wilkinson. They're running a freighting business um, that will also uh, include passenger ships. Uh, this is a, a, just a little picture that I grabbed from a 1954 paper that shows uh, an old barge um, that was built, I believe, on that northern dock right by the, the upper landing up here, probably. Um, and it was built, and I think it eventually burned, um, but it ran for a long time, and it was originally built for, for Dowdy and Wilson, or Wilkinson. Um, and then down here, we've got David Arnold. He's at this point, he owns the mill and the Hoffman house um, and he's renting them out here in 1845. Um, and then over here, there's just a quick article about this, this warehouse, uh, which eventually will become uh, the ferry dock warehouse. And then in 1891, uh, eventually just burns down. Um, and they, this, this ad right here, uh, it's talking about what they used to get here, sloops carrying dye wood for the Innises and large flower commission for the Reynolds and Giffords has a grocery. Um, so all the same names that we've sort of seen around here for the last couple of decades, they're still dominating this area. Uh, and this is just a couple of maps from 1897, so you can get a little bit of, so this is a Sanborn map right here. Um, and they are really uh, detailed maps that show you what the buildings were made of, um, what kind of fire hazards were there because they were meant for insurance companies and firemen. And you can see right here, it says piles of dye woods. So you can, this is, there were just like stacks and stacks of lumber here and their mill and factory was right here um, across the street. And here's the Arnold still just doing his thing. So at Main Street Dock, um, a lot more activity down here. Um, some of the same names though, we've got Vassar, uh, we've got some lumber here. W. Davies family still owns some of this property. You can see Davies up here, Davies up here. Here's the Exchange Hotel um, and the Vassar Brickyards right here, uh, now very conveniently located uh, right by the railroad station. So good for him. Uh, <laughs> And so uh, more and more lumber and now also coal, we're starting to see these, these huge warehouses and, and yard, lumber yards uh, stacked up along the waterfront, uh, lumber and coal, lumber and coal. Um, you see different names over the years for some of them, but it, the business doesn't change much. So here's Raymond and Hodges. They're saying it's on Vassar and Co's dock right down here. Um, and then we've got DC Foster right over here. And then uh, we have our Exchange Hotel again, um, operating by the Main Street Landing. And here is just a quick notice about some of the ships that are going out. This Vincent & Co is dissolved. That was those guys from back there. They're starting a new business. Um, and then we're starting to see other activity. The Exchange Hotel here with the Phoenix Hose Company is having their ball down there. Um, and then up here, just a little bit off, we see the Chichester Chair Manufacturer. Um, and I just pulled this ad that was talking about 
uh, two men getting uh, injured there. And it's just a reminder that this was a very, you know, this, a lot of this was dangerous, dirty work that people were doing in these factories. Um, and you'll, you'll see bits and pieces of it in ads like this, but uh, they don't really talk about it much in the histories, um, what was happening in there. Well, let's talk a little bit about Chichester. Um, it was established in 1846 by Samuel Chichester, who was born 1801 in Cairo, New York. Uh, it employed both men in the factories working uh, doing the carpentry and women at home were caning the seats. Uh, this right here is a little stool that we have um, in the local history collection. Um, as you can tell, probably, this is not an original seat or grommets. Those have all been replaced, uh, but the wood is all original and there is the metal uh, caning underneath is intact. Uh, the establishment of railroads west of Kingston really uh, opened up his opportunity for Catskill lumber. So Chichester built a second factory out there, uh, which ended up having a small factory town also named Chichester in the Catskills. Um, and this factory eventually becomes a wheelbarrow factory and uh, later becomes row houses and then is finally demolished in the 1960s during the creation of the arterials. And now iron. Iron, this is a big one. Uh, the Bushnell Blast Furnace. Uh, in 1848, he purchases the Union Landing uh, and builds the first foundry on the waterfront. Um, Albert Tower is soon brought in to run the newly established Poughkeepsie Iron Works, as well as the foundry. Um, there's a foundry also at Upper Landing. Um, the, the ore being smelted was mostly brought from Sylvan Lake and it was fluxed with limestone. Uh, and this, yeah, down here at Union Landing, you can see it. Um, and then at Lower Landing, we've just got a couple of things to point out. Uh, there's Fanning Rope Works, and here's the Southwood Tannery. I couldn't find much on either of these guys. Um, but you can see that this uh, this bay has also not been filled in. Here's Shipyard Point and Lower Landing. And, you, and as uh, this will change soon, um, but it is still open as of this point. Um, all right, now move to 1867. I'll try to speed it up a little, sorry guys. Uh, WWJ Reynolds are still operating at Upper Landing as are Gifford Sherman and Emmis, uh, Dowdy and Wilson. It's all pretty much the same, except we've got C. Murphy up here running an ice house um, because now this is becoming a pretty big industry by the waterfront and anywhere where there's bodies of water, uh, you're starting to see the ice become uh, a more major economy. Um, he's also running lime docks, or lime kilns, but he takes over the shipyard. He doesn't really build any ships. I'm not sure what he was planning to do with that, but didn't, didn't much happen. Uh, back on Main Street, we've got several coal operations and lumber. Uh, same guys, we got Reynolds up here. There's now it's Hall, Lum is over here. And the hotels are now uh, becoming very, very prominent down here because we've got the trains and the boats. So we got the Exchange Hotel here. Uh, this is, I believe, the Tremont. Um, oh, here's the Tremont, um, the Prospect. There's a city hotel up here. Uh, but there's, of all the hotels from the 1867 directory, one, two, three, four, six uh, are right down by the waterfront. So you can really see the industry changing down there. Uh, and up, up the hill a bit on Call Rock, there's finally something besides some houses, uh, and that is Fred Gelman's Brewery, uh, which he establishes in 1861. Uh, clearly in response to uh, the success of Matthew Vassar, you know, industries tend to piggyback on each other. Um, it is purchased by the Gilman family. They move up from Brooklyn in 1863, and they remain there for 80 years operating this, this brewery. Um, they made pine ale, beer, cider, carbonated water, and soft drinks. Um, and in the, in the 20th century, uh, it was a restaurant for a period of time and also apartments. Um, and now, as you know, there's, there's nothing left up there uh, in terms of buildings. Okay, and so the Bushnell foundry has become the Poughkeepsie Ironworks. Uh, and as you can see, it is a much bigger complex than it was in 1850. Things have really ramped up down there. Um, they bring in Albert Tower, who was born in 1817. Uh, he was already a very wealthy man. He'd become wealthy in the iron industry in Ohio when they brought him in to run these businesses. Um, and he's operating both this location and the Falco Ironworks, which is up on the whaling docks. 
um, these two, even though, I mean, it was questionable how they were different in the first place because the same man was running them, but they officially merged in 1875. Um, and by the mid 1880s, this, the Union Landing uh, dock has been pretty much abandoned. Uh, if you ever spend time down there at that Call Rock Park, you can see all of the, the remnants of the industry down there, the old concrete blocks and the various dockings and landings. Um, I think that a lot of that is probably from the Poughkeepsie Iron Works. Uh, this is just a, a very um, pastoral uh, sort of view of the ironworks, which seems funny because the photographs, they don't look like that at all. They're much, much darker and dirtier. Um, but you can see the sort of Hudson River School-esque vibe to this one, uh, showing this beautiful view probably right here, standing on Call Rock, looking down over the foundry and the furnaces. All right, another big guy, the Adrian's. Um, so Don P. Adrian's, uh, he's born in 19, in, I'm sorry, that's supposed to be in eight, 1825 in Poughkeepsie. Um, he was educated here, uh, but he moves to New York City when he's a young man to, uh, you know, find his fortune as it were. Um, and this is, by the way, this is just south of the ironworks, this area right here, you can see the tannery right here. It's basically where Shadows is today. Um, so in 1852, he partners with his brother-in-law, Samuel Platt and Samuel Sears to form a wholesale hardware business, Sears, Adrian's, and Platt. Uh, meanwhile, his father, who was also in the hardware business uh, and also named John, um, they both become interested in mowers. So they were really trying to figure out a way to get into that business. Um, and so in 1855, at a, a trade show, um, he purchases the patent for the Manny mower and establishes a factory in Worcester. Um, and this is the big one, this is the Buckeye. So in 1857, he buys a different patent um, for Lewis Miller's Buckeye Mower, which won the first prize at the trials. And this is just a, a look of, of how they look. They're quite, quite beautiful, sleek machines, I think. Um, so in 1859, Adrian moves back from Massachusetts to Poughkeepsie. Uh, and in 1863, Sears leaves. So comes Adrian's Platt & Co. Uh, the waterfront building is built uh, sometime around 1865. They had been a little bit eastern, east, more eastward before that. Um, and that's when you see this, this huge structure kind of go up. Um, uh, the business thrives. Uh, they do very, very well for themselves uh, until 1913 when his children, he dies about 1891, and his children decide that they no longer are interested in carrying on the business. Um, so they sell it to Moline Plow. And unfortunately, Moline Plow is bankrupted by World War I. Uh, supposedly, they had made some deals with the Tsarist government. And when that collapsed, uh, those debts went unpaid and they fall into bankruptcy. And the factory lies dormant until 1918, or from 1918 until 1939, it lies dormant. Uh, and in 1939, it is destroyed in a fire. Uh, but part of the reason that they were so successful um, other than, you know, the design of the machines, they were lightweight and useful, um, but also they were very skilled marketers. Um, they were one of the first uh, agricultural companies to have full color uh, brochures. And they had these beautiful enticing advertisements with their, you know, buxom peasant girls uh, and red cheeked young men operating these things. Um, and that really was a big contributor to their success. Um, and you can see this is just a little picture of what the factory looked like at full steam uh, in the 1870s. Uh, as you probably know, uh, the Adrian's Memorial Library uh, was indeed named for John P. Adrian's and his wife, Mary Jane Ruthven Platt Adrian's. Uh, after their deaths, their six children donated the funds to build this building. Uh, and it went up in 1898 and was named in their honor. So, you know, got to give them credit. And here's just another quick picture of the southern waterfront. Things don't change much down here. We've got some freighting and shipping and lumber yards, um, but I wanted to just call attention to, you can see the shoreline changing. Um, here's Columbia, Columbia, Livingston, Livingston. And you can see here it's starting, they're getting cleaned up and straightened out. And then over here, they're getting much more filled in. Um, they're really trying to maximize the space down there and get as much as they can. And they're, they're filling in a lot of, sort of tidal uh, swampiness down there. All right, now we're gonna really quickly go through this 1874 map. 
doesn't have a ton of information on it, but I really like it uh, for the 3D images. Um, so here you can see there's, here's the Fault Hill Ironworks up here. Um, here's all of the upper landing stuff with the, here's the Innes uh, Diewood Mills and here's Arnold's factory and here's the Reynolds stores and uh, the Dowdy shipyards. And here we've got a steamboat here. Interesting about this one is this bridge does not exist yet here at this time frame. Um, but they were talking about it and they've been pushing for it and they really wanted it. Um, but you can see it just kind of goes into nowhere here. Um, so yes, this is a little bit of a falsehood. This bridge does not exist yet at this point. Uh, down at the Main Street dock, sort of our same, our same guys uh, all over again. Um, you can see at this point that the Hudson River Railroad has merged with the New York City Railroad. Uh, the depot's right here in various hotels. Here's Matthew Vassar's building. There's Call the Dock. Uh, and then south, the ironwork's still going down here at this point. Um, here's a nice little picture of Vassar that they've inserted there for us. Um, and Adrian's Platt and Co. And the lower landing. I just, I just like these. I feel like it's, it's a little easier to picture when you look at this stuff. Um, and now we go to 1886. Um, we've got the ironwork still. Um, again, proposed bridge and railroad. Uh, this one's a little clearer that it doesn't quite exist yet because they've got these little dots, but you can see that it, it's in it's in the works at this point. By 1886, it is about to be a reality. Um, and so they sort of included that they assume it will be here. All our same guys are here, Gifford, Sherman, and Innes, uh, Reynolds, Arnold, old friends. Uh, and this is just a, a really nice picture of that area uh, north of the bridge, taken from the bridge. Um, and you, you can really, you get the sense of what we're talking about here. You can feel the sort of smoke and steam in the air uh, from all these factories. And we've got the ironworks right over here. Um, and everyone's just kind of belching smoke. Main Street Landing again, not much changing, although you really, you can see the streets filling in. All of those planned streets now have, have buildings and houses. Um, and everything's starting to cluster much more around the railroad as opposed to the waterfront. We still have a lot of these factories and lumber yards. These guys are all still going, um, but they're sort of changed their direction into the, you know, they're, they're more focused up here. Um, and at this point, uh, I don't know if we talk about it now or in a couple of slides, but the Reynolds have moved their entire uh, wholesale store over to the train station. We'll get to that in a minute. Another view of the waterfront around this time. This is the Main Street dock here. You can see one of the day liners. Um, here's Matthew Vassar's operation and these some of the lumber and coal yards right here. Uh, south waterfront, again, not too much different. We've got still got Collingwood down here. They're doing lumber and coal. South, I don't know if the tannery is still running here or not, but they still consider the Southwick property. Um, and the ironworks aren't really happening. There's not much here, but they still own the property. And so the railroad bridge, we're gonna talk real quickly about this. Um, it was uh, the work again of many of these uh, wealthy industrialists. They really, really wanted this passageway to come through here. Uh, ultimately, I'm not exactly sure why, because it doesn't really, I mean, it certainly doesn't really affect waterfront commerce. Um, the trains are passing in the other direction. Um, the North-South Railroad had a much bigger effect. Um, but after years of raising funds and, and lobbying, uh, this is a cartoon of Harvey Eastman, who was the mayor and also owner of Eastman Business College. He was a big proponent of this bridge. Um, and here he is trying to sell, sell shares to, to, to raise some money for it. Um, and this picture down here shows you just they're about to meet. And yeah, it's, it doesn't really change what happens on the waterfront, but it certainly changes the, the aspect and the look of it. Um, and it's sort of a symbolic uh, gesture of the railroad sort of beating the river in a, in a final sort of way um, and becoming the real dominant form of transportation. And I just grabbed a couple of postcards that I thought were really beautiful. Um, here we've got the Falk Hill Landing right here. Some of these large dayliners coming through. Um, this is just a, a view from the western side. This is a ferry. Um, this, this could very well have been uh, the Brinkerhoff Ferry. 
um, which was uh, run by Captain John Brinkerhoff. Uh, he purchased the Poughkeepsie Transportation Company in 1878. Um, and he's a big contributor to upper landing really falling into disuse because he makes the decision in 1879 uh, to move the ferry docking to Main Street. So there's really no more passenger uh, shipping coming in and out of upper landing at this point. Um, and he has a, a very, very grand home that's still standing on uh, South Hamilton Street. I walk by it pretty much daily and I, I marvel at it every time. It's supposed to have been built to resemble uh, the ferry boats and it's got, it, you should check it out sometime. It's really pretty. Um, and then this one I also liked because it's it's Adrian's Platt. They're, they're celebrating the bridge, uh, but they're also making sure that they are very much in the foreground here. Uh, again, and these guys are advertisers. They know what to do. Um, so make sure that you keep, you keep your eyes on them. Uh, so we we'll move up to the last decade of the century, and I promise we'll be, we'll be through most of this pretty quickly. Um, so this is a ward map, uh, which is really similar to those Sanborn maps. Um, and as you can see, they're much more detailed. Uh, you really get, you know, every single structure is on here, what they're made of, what their color, you know, the colors indicate different materials um, and what might have been uh, they made of. Um, at this point, uh, the Falco Ironworks is the only furnace running on the waterfront. Um, there's been new competition from the South and West for this, for the, ore, the iron ore industry. Um, and it, it takes, a, the economy takes a hit. And so there's not quite as much of this happening in Poughkeepsie uh, as there used to be at the blast furnaces. Um, but there is a, a brand new industry at the waterfront and that is the glassworks. So the Poughkeepsie Glassworks was started in 1881 uh, to utilize a technique of using iron slag and glass, uh, a technique that was patented in England um, you can see why they would have done it here. It's very close to the Iron Foundry. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just gonna sip of water. But so yes, yeah, so they're located right near the ironworks. <coughs> um, <clears throat> and they create these, these continuously running tanks um, to make the glass and blow the glass. And so it is the first continuous tank in the United States. Uh, it's running 24 hours a day when the factories are going, and that means that there are men working every shift. Uh, and by April 1897, <clears throat> they had three tanks up, uh, and they were had an output of 130,000 uh, bottles and glasses a year. Um, during the busiest part of the year, which was September to July, uh, the factory employed 350 skilled workers. Uh, so it was a, a really a good. Um, a good part of the economy for us and it was you know good skilled labor so you you'd assume the wages were <clears throat> somewhat better uh, because of the unrelenting heat involved in the process of making glass the factory did not really operate during july and august uh there was no air conditioning they couldn't they just couldn't they they would they would have died of heat stroke i would imagine uh, and here are just a couple of examples of poughkeepsie glass work models that we have in our collection um, you can see that there are beer, soda, milk, um, prescription bottles. I really love the prescription bottles. Um, and a lot, most of these were local druggists um, and they would have all of their things manufactured at the glassworks uh, because this was a period in which the city was pretty self-sufficient. Um, we, were, we were producing many of the things that we needed right here. Um, and the Poughkeepsie Glassworks made glass for pr pretty much every industry that had to bottle something. So yes, at this point, um, not a ton happening at Upper Landing. Um, Innis and Co, they're still here. Uh, they're kind of limping along a little bit because chemical dyes uh, have started to become more prevalent and they've really put a hurt on the, the dye wood industry. Um, but they still, they managed to go on until about 1902. Uh, the Reynolds have cleared out completely. Um, but see Arnold, he's still, he's still sticking it out down here. And there's also this fall kill knitting mill, which I could not find out much about, um, but they're operating out of one of the old Reynolds warehouses. Um, and this, this was that Poughkeepsie Transportation Company building uh, that was abandoned by Brinkerhoff in 1879. Uh, it finally burns down in 1891. Uh, and apparently Arnold stays in, stays in place here until 1935, um, despite 
labor disputes and competition, they, they stick it out for as long as they possibly can down here. Uh, there is something new down on the waterfront though, and that is the Poughkeepsie Electric Power and Light Company. Uh, electricity is really becoming a, a bigger part of everyone's lives and they need power plants. So they, they build this power plant down here, right on the waterfront, right where that um, the Poughkeepsie Transportation Co. dock had burned. Um, the Reynolds sell it to the transport, the electric company in 1894. Um, and the company expands and becomes something that will sound pretty familiar to you, Central Hudson Gas and Electric. Um, and by 1911, Central Hudson pretty much owns all of Upper Landing. So they really take over this site and they still own much of it today. Again, we really see the commerce has clustered around the train station here. Um, this is, this is the, main, the main avenue down by the waterfront. We've got everybody, uh, we've got, here's a transportation company here. Here's our ferry dock, which has gotten very elaborate. Um, still coal and lumber. Uh, and I think we're gonna show, yeah, okay. So here is where the Reynolds have moved. So they are, as you can see, right by the depot. Um, they own this whole thing. This is the building that is now uh, houses Mahoney's um, and all the other things that are down there in the train station parking lot, which is located right here where the old depot was. And it's just a picture of what that warehouse and might've looked like at the time. Uh, we have so many pictures of the Reynolds uh, employees. They, for some reason, there's just a lot of pictures of them like hanging out on their, on their, their docks and their landings. Um, all over this collection. I don't know why, but maybe again from Helen Wilkinson. Um, all right, and now there's just one more, uh, one more business that I'm really gonna talk about down here. Um, and that is, well, okay, so this is quickly, you can see that there's nothing left here uh, where the iron foundry was. It's, it's really pretty much just empty land now. But then here's our last guy that we're gonna talk about. And that is De Laval. Uh, De Laval was a Swedish company. Um, it was uh, founded by Dr. Gustav De Laval, who manufactured and patented a machine to separate cream from milk. Um, in 1892, uh, they decided to build a US manufacturing plant um, and they built it right here in Poughkeepsie, just south of Lower Landing um, in a spot that we all know is uh, under uh, considerable scrutiny today. Um, and it starts out with just a few small buildings um, it was the first factory in Poughkeepsie uh, to be powered by uh, electric turbine engine um, and its machine shop was pretty much self-sufficient. So they created uh, almost all the tools and machines that they needed to make their tools and machines uh, right here on site. Um, it initially employed 50 men, but it very quickly grew as the business took off. And just here's a little quick comparison. This is what De Laval looked like in 1900. And this is what it looked like in 1948. So quite a big industry. Uh, for most of the 20th century, uh, De Laval, later called Alpha Laval, uh, was a major employer in Poughkeepsie. Um, they expanded into other products, mostly industrial. Um, although there was uh, a story of one, they made a, a, a mechanical cocktail mixer um, that was apparently tested out at the Nelson House um, and worked very well. Uh, in 1964, they uh, moved the manufacturing eastward into the town of Poughkeepsie. Uh, and by 1990, the company has left Poughkeepsie altogether. Um, it still does exist as a subsidiary of Tetra Laval, um, but they are no longer a part of our region. And we're just gonna end on my old friend, the Exchange Hotel. This is a picture of the Main Street Dock in 1898. Um, and here's this, there's a nice picture of the Exchange Hotel. Um, it was always owned by the various transportation companies and operated by other folks, but owned by the transportation companies. Um, and so in 1890s, uh, the Central Hudson Steamboat Company, uh, which is what had, who was owning the dock at that point, um, they decided that it had become too dilapidated. I don't believe it was even being occupied. Um, and they decided to divest themselves of the structure. Um, as you can see, here's an ad in the paper where they are selling it off brick by stone. Um, on the premises, all the wood, brick, stone, et cetera, of the Exchange Hotel at the foot of Main Street. 
in 1899. And that's that for the Exchange Hotel. And it's kind of, you know, symbolic of, of what's going to happen in the next century to come um, as the waterfront really changes. But so I'm just going to end it there because as you can see, that's enough. <laughs> uh, but at this point, um, you can unmute yourselves if you like. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And if you've got any comments or things that you'd like to talk about, uh, any corrections, uh, I'm happy to hear it. Um, so yeah. Anybody? Excellent. <laughs> Excellent presentation. Thank you. Terrific maps. I love the maps. The, that, the thing that was the most exciting for me about this was um, getting to go through the maps because they're my absolute favorite thing in the collection. Absolutely. I love looking at them. And we're, we're hoping to get them digitized sometime soon so that they'll be a little bit more accessible to everybody if they want to look at them. Like people can come in and look at them now, um, but it is a little trickier um, because of the way they're housed and how delicate they are. So, so we're hoping to get them scanned and much more available to everybody. Kate, do you have any pictures of the Dayliner dock? Um, well, the, the Dayliner dock is, is that Main Street dock, but it, it changes a lot in the early 20th century. They built a new um, weight station for the Dayliners. Um, and, and yeah, like so, some of that I think is, is more 20th century stuff. Um, and I think there's more, I don't know if there's a ton of pictures of the docks though, actually. Um, but one of the things that we have been considering is doing an entire program on the Dayliners themselves. Um, cause I know that's been a lot of, uh, a lot of people have memories of them. It's one of those things that sort of spans centuries, but there's still people that have memories of them and that's always nice. Um, so that might be a topic that we just tackled where we just talk about the dayliners and that industry and what it meant, um, for Poughkeepsie and everybody else. Are you saying that the dayliner didn't really run in the 19th century? Oh, no, it did. It just, the docks looked a lot different. Um, uh, like uh, when they tore down the Exchange Hotel, they built um, the big, well, uh, basically the station for the Dayliners. Um, and so I, I don't think that there was um, as grand uh, an entry uh, to that space in the, in the 19th century, but they were definitely running um, for sure. By then the Dayline dock was much smaller, but the boats were very long hmm. and extended way beyond the dock. Yeah, some of those postcards, the postcards are probably early 20th century, a lot of them, and you can see that they're just massive, um, huge, huge, gorgeous ships. We have tons of pictures of, of those boats too, the Mary Powell. Um, if you look at Maine and Market, we have a lot of images of the boats themselves, some sketches, some pictures. The, the film material along the shoreline over the, the, the years, where did all that fill come from? That is an excellent question. Um, I, I do not know the answer to that. I mean, I would assume that they just excavated, you know, as close by as they could. Um, but yeah, no, that's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look into that. Where did the fill come from? Yeah, because like New York City built up the, the, the battery with fill, so they got that from somewhere. Yeah, well, the battery, I believe, came from the World Trade Center. Um, like that, that was all the, the hole they built for the World Trade Center, they dumped right into Battery Park City. Um, but New York City also did a ton of other filling all, you know, over the centuries. Like if you look at the maps of 1600s Manhattan, uh, their, their waterfront is also completely unrecognizable. They, they filled in, you know, that whole area down there, uh, including, um, yeah, well, well, yeah, it's all, yeah, similar story. Uh, and I'm just going to throw my email in the chat just in case anyone doesn't have it because um, I love feedback. If there's something you want to know more about, um, if you want copies of the presentation, um, whatever, I, like, I love to hear from you. And if, if you are interested in hearing something that's more about the 20th century, please let me know and I'll work on that too. Um, and oh, let me just, I'm going to pop up my screen share just for one more minute so I can show you my sources um, so you can get a better idea of where I was getting some of this material. If you're interested in learning more 
Um, Platt's history of Poughkeepsie was a big one for me. Obviously the newspaper I used over and over again. Um, but also this Upper Landing Park website is fantastic. If you were interested in a more in-depth history of the Upper Landing, they have, I, I could have done a whole presentation on, you know, just that site. Um, they've gone into such detail. So it was really, really wonderful. And I would advise you check that out if you're interested. Um, but yeah, just a couple couple different articles, uh, one from Tony Musso. Um, this history of whaling was from uh, Sandra Smith, I believe her name is, who wrote uh, a Vassar thesis. Um, lots of really, really great stuff in there. Let's see, I've got something in the chat. Oh, Warren Skinner was the proprietor of the Exchange House Hotel, and he was a member of the Poughkeepsie Improvement Party. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, the Poughkeepsie Improvement Party was a, a big part of all of that sort of industrial speculation. Um, and some of it was true improvements. Um, they, they did a lot, you know, they, they made a lot of money, but they did give a lot back to the city. Um, that was the sort of ethos of the time. Uh, with this sort of robber baron type guys. Uh, so at least we had that. Um, all right, D David Crosby Foster. Uh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Stacey. Will this, will this presentation be available uh, recorded or can we access it in the future? Yeah, I am recording it. So uh, when we finish up here uh, and it all gets sorted out, it'll be up on our YouTube page. Um, which, you know, I, I can send out links to people if you want. Uh, I don't know necessarily going to send it out to everyone, but if you email me and say, you know, please send me a link when it's up, um, I'm happy to send that out to whoever would like. Um, and it should be up there as long, along with um, several other presentations. Some of the ones my colleague Shannon has done uh, are up there. And she's also made a couple short movies about some of this local history stuff. Uh, so there's a lot of great content on the YouTube page. Um, and if you're interested, I'm happy to send you a link. Thank you. Okay, we got, we got some votes for a sequel. That's good to know. Hey, Tony. <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much. Um, I'm sure if not, I will tell you she had to do a phenomenal amount of work to put this on for all of us in Poughkeepsie. Uh, it's just amazing the amount of information that you were able to uh, put out there for us. It's just incredible to to follow it through, and you made it really, really, really very interesting. And oh, the thank pace, you. Yeah, the pace was just perfect. Um, I loved the stool from the Chichester. I thought that was very <laughs> cool, and the bottles as well. Um, so maybe just to put out there that um, I see Melody Moore is here from the Historical Society. Um, please, if you find things. You know, this, the, the library and the society, we don't want to see them, you know, tossed away. Everything is significant. At least ask about it because uh, we learned so much from all of this and, and seeing them in her pres presentation um, just really added a whole dimension to that, the history of the waterfront. It was really, really good. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's tough because I felt, you know, as I was doing this and I was realizing how much stuff there was to talk about um, and that I knew I wasn't going to be able to get into too much depth on any of it. Um, but I really wanted to do a sort of holistic longitudinal mm -hmm. approach to it so we could sort of see the way it, it changes and grows. Um, and let's see, Sarah says, was there ever an exhibition organized? I mean, I'm not sure. I know that there were, I mean, there was always exhibitions at the, um, the, count, the, the county fair would always have these guys showing off their newest uh, equipment. Um, so they, they would bring whatever their latest, they, there was, that De La Vol ad I think was talking about how it was gonna be at the Poughkeepsie Fair. Um, I don't know about anything in sort of a historical exhibition, but we, most of the stuff that we have here, like the bottles and the stools, we have them on display in our genealogy room. Um, and that stuff's always available to come take a look. I mean, they're not huge cases, but we have a case downstairs and a case in genealogy that have some of our historical materials um, that people are welcome to come check out anytime because genealogy is open again. Uh, we're all open again in the, in the old building. So feel free to come back in. <laughs> I know it's been a while. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great show. I um, 
I'm following you. I'm out of Martha's Vineyard. I'm one of the descendants oh, of, of uh, uh, the Dutton Lumber Corporation. And uh, if you follow through with um, the next century, if I have any just stories that I can help you with about that, I would be happy to. Oh, that'd be great. Yes. Yeah, um, shoot me an email with your contact info because I, I'd love to get some more some more personal info on that stuff. Yeah, and we are um, we are a, in the in the past century we were a whaling center out here too, as you. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's really yeah, it's really interesting to watch uh, watch these guys kind of catch an idea and try to follow it. Oh yeah, yep. That was great. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Does anyone else have anything else they want to talk about? I know it's not not too much of a discussion group, uh, but but um, would, this is John Bickford. I would just add, uh, uh, I was very grateful for it as well, and look forward to a twentieth century. All right. I will. I will make sure to get working on that then. Uh, I thought. I mean, the twentieth century is going to be a very different kind of story um, than this sort of like triumph of industrialism. Uh, but, but I think that that story is really interesting too and really important. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to look into that as well. And it, you know, in some ways it'll be easier because there's a lot more documentation. Um, although in other ways, and this is really unfortunate, um, you know, these 19th century maps have detail that 20th century maps don't and, and the maps are such a, a huge part of, of this kind of stuff for me. So it'll be harder in a different way because I won't have as much information right at my fingertips on the maps. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm interested to follow through and see see more about what happens in that in that century as well. Uh, that is a good question. Tracy asks if Davies Hardware is in the same family. Uh, I am not sure about that, but I can look into it. Davies Hardware. I mean, a lot of these families, the old families, tend to stick around. Um, so I'm sure there's someone someone connected somewhere. The next century, you can include some of the old century with the uh, history of rowing that started out yes. at uh, at Reynolds and at uh, at what was the first boat club, which was the uh, Shadamuck Boat Club, that was run off a barge and that sank and kind of fell into dis dis disuse and. Um, People didn't really row out of there much anyway. They were members, but they didn't row much. People like Matthew Vassar. But Reynolds, one of the Reynolds actually did row. And um, and then the Apokepsi Boat Club on the north side of Cal Rock, or excuse me, um, of uh, Upper Landing. Yeah. Eventually being floated down to uh, what is now Cal Rock Park. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I had wanted to get into the rowing uh, originally. That had obviously been a huge portion of what I was going to talk about. But when I realized where I had to stop, oh, um, yeah. and then I was just like, I was afraid that this thing was just going to blow up to take way too much time. But I definitely do want to cover that because it is a huge part of the waterfront as well. Um, uh, and it, yeah, and it definitely starts bef before the 20th century. Um, and apple kipsing, we have a lot of apple kipsing stuff here. Um, you know, they did they did a lot more than row. Um, they were a real social club as well. So we have all kinds of stuff from plays that they would put on. Um, so there's definitely a lot to cover there as well. And we didn't even talk about ice boating. Right. That's your next assignment. Uh, yeah, I get that. <laughs> get to work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, this was a, a, a huge response that I was not really expecting. Um, and it's really gratifying to see so many people uh, so interested in local history. And I hope I lived up to your expectations. Um, and I will certainly uh, get working on the next 120 years. Uh, and and we'll, we'll, we'll move on with that uh, next time. Thank you. All right, anything else from anybody? Great show. <laughs> All right, well, uh, I think we're gonna, we're gonna sign off on that note. Thank you so much for coming. Um, the next one we're gonna be doing is, I believe in May, Shannon's gonna be talking about uh, historic houses in the Hudson Valley. 
Uh, so that one should be really great too. She definitely is an expert on that topic. Um, and I'm sure we'll give you a wonderful presentation and I will get working on 20th century and we will, I'll get that to you as soon as I can and we'll let you know. All right. Okay, folks. Thank Have you. a great Thank weekend. You. Thank you. Thank you so much.